Hi everyone, welcome to the Zdansky Uni session. And my name is Gedra and today I will try to give you a crash course of the banking, of the banking sector. So let's, let's say, let's see how it, how it goes. Today's session we decided to call banking in a nutshell. And it's of course very difficult to uh, convey and to explain this difficult topic in 15 minutes, but I'll try and I'll try to cover only the main uh, notions and concepts, of course. So let's get started. During next 15 to 20 minutes, we will cover a few main topics, and that's going to be the following. So what's the bank's role in the economy? How banks operate, how they make money, and how they work in general. And then we will quickly uh, look into how the past, the present, and the future of the banking might be looking like. And if we were to remember only three main things, about the banking, about the banking sector as such, we should probably concentrate on the following. So first of all, banks facilitate money flow in the financial system. And that's not only payments. That's quite important to understand. That's mainly about money supply. And we will, show, we will shortly cover that in next slides. Then second point is, of course, banks are companies. Uh, they are not non-profit organizations, they are not uh, usually nationally owned uh, organizations. They are companies just like everyone else and obviously they want to make money and they want to uh, provide and give proper return to their shareholders. And the third point, really, really important one, is that substantial part of the banking business is trust. Without trust, banks and banking sector is nothing. And that's where I would like to sort of refer or mention one example from history from rather long time ago, because I believe it's, it's rather interesting uh, in a way to understand why the trust is so important. When the Great Depression hit the US in the beginning of 30s, uh, last century, a uh, major banking crisis ensued and obviously banks were crashing, many depositors were taking their deposits out of the banks. So what happened then uh, was freshly uh, elected, uh, the president of the United States, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, went on the radio and spent like 15 minutes talking to the people of the United States about the banking. It took 15 minutes for the president to explain uh, what the government has done, what kind of regulations they have imposed, and why the public, the people, should actually trust the banking sector. And after that speech, people were again queuing up next to the banks, and this time they wanted to bring their deposits back to the banking sector. That's why and that's how the trust is crucial for the banking. Now let's quickly look into what composes the financial system. And uh, that's where I, I usually like and uh, enjoy talking about the banking system as uh, the financial system, probably, I should say, as a human body. And first of all, let's talk about the blood, which is money. So obviously, in current environment, when the notion of economic exchange of goods is based on money, uh, well, everything in, is measured in money, and money carries the value in the economy, in any economic environment. And, uh, well, that's, that's the main truth, probably, in our economic systems, and that's how it should continue operating going forward. Now, central banks. Central banks are probably should be called the brain of, of the financial system. So how, uh, how are they the brain and this is the most important computer of the financial system? First of all, central banks print the money. That's kind of interesting because they print banknotes, they mint coins, and uh, well, they produce, they have a specific right to produce the money circulating in any economy. But that's probably not quite the most important uh, function that they, that they do. They also employ different monetary uh, policy mechanisms and uh, the same measures to influence economic environment and economic growth. And by doing so, they are using interest rates. So you might probably have heard uh, or have read in newspapers that uh, certain central bank has decided to raise 
or cut interest rates. That is quite important, actually, because if economy goes downwards and economic growth, GDP growth uh, goes down and, and economy contracts, central banks usually react and they usually decrease interest rates. Thus, they support the credit market, thus they support or encourage the public to borrow more, and that is where economic growth starts to, let's say, recover. And vice versa. If the economy is booming out of, out of any control, the risk of inflation arises. And that's where central banks would be raising interest rates in order to curb um, inflation. Now, very quickly, just do a few sentences about what kind of, um, let's say, measures central banks have. So there are many of those measures. First of all, there are open market operations, which central banks use to facilitate a banking system in terms of short-term funding. And then there are extraordinary, um, let's say, measures, uh, for example, securities buying, whereby central banks would be buying all sorts of sovereign and at times even um, corporate securities in order to fund uh, the financial system and make money more accessible. So central banks are very, very important. They have all sorts of tools to influence economic activity in any economy. Now, having said that, I probably have to mention that central banks also make mistakes. And uh, it's, it's rather interesting to investigate or, or study uh, past mistakes of the central bank. So for example, again, back in 1930s, um, uh, then Reichsbank, uh, which was later replaced, obviously, by the Bundesbank in Germany, Reichsbank has started printing huge, huge, huge amounts of paper money. And that spurred, of course, a huge hyperinflation in what was then uh, Germany. Um, again, another example comes from the US. When the Great Depression hit uh, the US, the Federal Reserve System, which was only 16 years old then, <laughs> started raising interest rates instead of cutting them to, to cope with this economic recession. And well, this did not work all that well, as we all know, because the Great Depression was probably the, the most severe economic uh, downturn in any country. So central banks have historically made huge mistakes. Hopefully they learn and uh, now uh, we have more robust uh, solutions and decisions from the central banks. Now let's move to commercial banks. So commercial banks probably is akin to the heart of our body, of our uh, economic environment and economic system, because commercial banks actually transmit the money in the system. Now, when we say transmit the money in the system, we probably first of all think about payment systems, and obviously commercial banks take quite a big part in, in operating uh, payment systems. And well, as we know, we are not, uh, they are not alone in, in that business. But what is even more important is that banks create money supply. And this is done in, well, rather simple, but also quite curious ways. So I'll draw something now to demonstrate uh, what money multiplier is. Let's imagine that we, as Danske Bank, have accepted the deposit that is, for example, 1 million Danish krona large. We have this deposit, we are able to lend the funds out. We will keep a little bit as a reserve, as per central bank's requirements, and we will lend the rest out. So let's say we are lending out 0 0.9 million Danish krona to the customer. And what happens, this customer actually places this um, amount of, of uh, cash to some other bank. This other bank will do just exactly as we did. They will keep a small reserve and they will lend the rest to some other customer. And now you probably can imagine what happens. So out of 1 million Danish krona, us as a banking system, we managed to create this amount of money. This proportion of the money created in comparison to initial deposit is called money multiplier. And commercial banks are 
instrumental and very, very important, I cannot stress this enough, very, very important in actually sustaining this money supply creation. Now let's play the game. Let's say that we have a bank to run. And let's try to create a good bank and to make it profitable. So how we will do that and where we will start. First of all, of course, we will start by taking in some deposits. Now, in order to attract deposits, first of all, we have to be extremely trustworthy. We have to gain customer trust so that they actually entrusted us in keeping their savings safe. Now, let's say we have gathered certain amount of deposits, customers placed their deposits with us. What is gonna happen, of course, we will start having interest expense. Well, probably not quite now because interest rates are at zero or at times even at negative rates. So it's a little bit more tricky talking about interest expense these days, but the notion still stands. We have usually have to pay something for the, the deposits that have been placed with us. So, well, for now we are not making any money yet. How will we start making our bank profitable? Well, we will do what I have just drawn on the board. We will start issuing loans. Now, issuing loans is, first of all, risky business, right? So we have to figure out whom we would like to lend to and how trustworthy our customers will be to be able to return their funds to us and also important to be able to pay interest payments to us. So a few things will have to be considered in this activity. We will of course consider how much, uh, what kind of proportion of our deposit base we will keep as, as we have seen in the previous, uh, in the previous drawing I did. Uh, so what is our reserve requirement? How much we want to keep as a safe cushion if the customers, if the depositors came back and requested the depositors, uh, deposits back. So we will keep something for us, but the rest can be lent out to our, to our customers. We will do, of course, credit assessment. We will, of course, carry credit risk, and we will shortly talk a little bit about industries, why they're different and how we are assessing credit risk, but still the notion stands, we will start issuing the loans. In addition to doing that, we will, of course, have an entire array of different products. So we will facilitate payments, obviously. We will, we will have, um, let's say, cash management solutions. We will offer our customers wealth management solutions. We will offer an advice uh, about, let's say, wealth management, about even trading, about market trends. And all of that will start bringing to our bank fee income. Fee income is very much important. That is why this third set of our products is also very much important. And then in addition to that, we will of course pro most probably will participate in uh, markets. We will trade financial products. We will help our customers to trade financial products. And that's where we will get trading income. We will have to be very careful with that, of course, because at times markets go up, at times markets go, go down. So trading income is, well, probably the least stable stream of the income that we can secure. And now then, so where is our secret? We sort of um, got certain deposits, we lend them back. So how will we eventually make any money? And that's indeed around us very carefully and diligently managing our risks. So one type of risk I have already mentioned that was uh, credit risk. It is hugely important that we choose our, uh, our customers who will be borrowing from us in a very diligent manner so that they are able to return the funds and the interest back to us. In addition to that, we of course have to manage liquidity risk, which means that we should be in a position to have enough funds if our depositors came back to us and wanted to take part of the deposits back. Yet another set of risk is, for example, interest rate risk. Um, let's say if we started uh, lending out funds um, 
that are um, that are connected with uh, longer term interest rates but for example our funding is is based on short term interest rates if the interest rates started going up very very fast or in a very rapid manner we might have a problem because we would need to refinance ourselves in a more and more expensive uh, funds. So that's where we would have interest rate risk. And there are more risks. We do not have time to cover all of these risks today, maybe at a later time. But indeed, the secret of us running a successful bank will be around diligent and careful risk management. So now let's quickly jump into uh, industries that we would be probably wanting to lend to. And is it so that all the companies are all the same? Is it really any different if we um, lend funds to one company or another company? So indeed, companies are actually not quite the same. And uh, we have this very broad distinction between cyclical industries and non-cyclical industries. So what does that mean? Very quickly, cyclical industries actually follow the business cycle. And of course, if economy is booming, booming cyclical industries and companies in, in these industries will be doing just fine. They will be booming, operating profits will be very nice and is going to be happy days. So obviously, uh, lending funds to cyclical industries when economy is doing very well is quite good, actually, because, because companies are doing very well. But the problem is that if uh, recession hits or if economic downturn comes, cyclical industries will be the ones that will suffer the first. So here I have on the slide a few examples of what cyclical industries are, and let's say these are hotels luxury uh, goods producers, durable goods, home appliances. So in a way, these are the products that customers simply stop buying if the economy is not doing all that well. And on the contrary, non-cyclical industries, of course, are the ones that do not follow economic cycle and they're doing moderately good in any of the business cycle stages. So obviously, economic downturn or not, everyone has to eat. And that is why food manufacturers are non-cyclical industries. So again, why are we talking about that? It's important for our bank to have a good understanding whom are we lending funds to. And it's also important for our bank to understand in which part of the economic cycle are we so that we can maximize our uh, profitability and obviously, to the best of our efforts, avoid credit risk. Now, let's look into why and how banks are companies, just like everyone else. So what I did here, I just took uh, another company for the comparison, and that's Lego. <laughs> Why Lego? Because, well, playing Lego is very fun and my kids love playing Lego and I played a lot of Lego with my kids. But no, so uh, I actually like um, exploring and investigating Lego financial statements because it's a joy to look at. It's a very clean uh, economic model that they're using and uh, it's a profitable business usually. They have had their own ups and downs historically they have solved those ups and downs but all in all it's really cool company to look at so if you were interested in studying financial statements go ahead and check out lego financial statements but hey uh, if we if we get back uh, to this analysis so what i want to show you is that even though dansky bank is just exactly very similar company to lego in in its notion uh, we both are companies, we both are trying to make profit. Uh, financial statements actually look a little bit different. And well, let's see why. So if you remember, financial statements consist of a few reports. And the first, obviously, um, very important report is balance sheet. Balance sheet consists of two equal parts, assets and liabilities. Assets always have to be equal to liabilities in any company. Another 
report, of course, <laughs> very, very important is profit and loss statement. So profit and loss statement uh, shows us revenues of the company, shows us expenses, few types of, of expenses, and out of all of that, we calculate the profit or loss that the company has made. So if we look, if we look at balance sheet statement of Danske Bank and Lego, we will see that in assets and liabilities, the most important articles or, or, or categories are actually quite different. So for the bank, for, for Danske Bank and any other bank, the largest proportion of assets will lie in loans. We earn our revenues from issuing loans. So 48% of our assets sit in loans. Other assets, of course, are let's say, securities that we have bought, and there are few more important categories in assets, but the most important is loans. Whereas in Lego, as we can see, 35% uh, of assets sits with uh, property, plant, and equipment. And well, that's kind of understandable because that's what they use uh, to make their product and uh, to, uh, to, to get their revenue. So quite a difference here. Now, if looking into our liabilities, we will also see that there is quite a difference. In the bank, a uh, third of our liability sits with deposits. Uh, whereas in Lego uh, and in any production company, uh, fair share of liability sits with, um, with payables, with trade payables. So what, what is trade payable? Is it is basically other customers of the company owing funds to Lego for their, uh, for their products that they had bought from Lego. So that's, that, that's quite, quite a difference. And then operating expenses, another curious point. Um, we see that half of Danske Bank operating expenses consist of staff cost. So it's in a way, uh, important to say that for the bank, uh, our employees, our staff is one of important assets, even though it does not sit on the balance sheet, right? But uh, uh, in, in our operating expenses, staff cost is quite important. Whereas for Lego, we see that only one third, uh, one fourth of, of the operating, operating expenses would be uh, staff cost. And why is that? Because obviously Lego buys different materials from which they make their product. And that is something that goes into operating expenses for Lego. We are not producing anything. That is why we do not have that article in our, uh, in our p &L. So that was just a short brief intro to the balance sheet and p &L. and uh, Hopefully, we will have some other occasion to talk about this a little bit more. But this session is going to an end already. So let me just quickly cover a little bit of history, a little bit of present, and a little bit of hopefully future. Now, in the past, what we saw in the banking sector was, well, quite a substantial decentralization. There were many, many banks um, most of them would not have branches. They would be relying and dependent on their communities. So in a way, they were lending funds to their narrow community member, uh, members. And that is why trust was so important. That is why there were trust issues. That is why there were uh, so many bankruptcies uh, of those small banks. And obviously, financial systems were rather local. Now, coming into the end of 20th century and into 21st century, we obviously have a huge internalization of the financial systems. We have banks becoming global banks. We have uh, markets becoming global markets. There is a huge access to any sort of information that you would like to get. Uh, there was a huge increase in... Uh, in correspondent relationships um, among different banks. So now banking sector and financial industry has become truly, truly global and it has become instant. Everything is known at the same instant. 
So what, does, what lies in the future? We might at times talk, okay, so when the time will come when fintechs will replace banks? Probably it's not around white and uh, black and white, and it's probably not quite a question whether or not fintechs will replace banks. It's probably more around discussing how they will operate in coordination, in collaboration. And we already see that banks themselves also have uh, certain fintech research uh, organizations in, in, in their structures. We have fintech-like solutions produced by the banks. We have major number of collaborations between the banks and fintech firms. So it's not really about the question, so when fintechs will replace this brick and mortar bank? Because, well, probably brick and mortar is not that relevant any longer for the banks. Banks are changing quite a bit as well. But again, focus on customer experience, advice, sustainable solutions, quick access to solutions. These are going to be the most important for points for customer experience. These are going to be points that will attract customers to use whatever solution produced by the bank or by, by the fintech firm. And that was all that I had for today. So I do hope that you enjoyed the session. I hope that you maybe learned something new or maybe you have other questions. If you do, just reach out to me. I will be happy to, to reply. Please make sure you check out Danske Uni updates and please come back for more.